All right, folks, you are listening to the Shai Fleischer Show, broadcasting live as I drive. That's right. Uh, I'm on the way down south right now, uh, and it's been so busy because of uh, the war, the efforts, the media, the politics, and all the stuff. And so um, I'm using this time that I have right now to talk with you and to send you blessings from the good land. And I want to tell you something. Uh, if you're reading the media, you may see a lot of darkness, but there's actually an amazing amount of light coming out of Israel right now. It's one of the most lit up times that I've, that I've ever felt. I, I feel a tremendous light right now. And by the way, there are many little good newses that may not be uh, uh, you know, overly kind of uh, um, displayed or covered. Uh, but for example, Air Canada is starting their flights again. I thought that was a little good news. I'm like, good. Okay, good. The airplanes are starting to come back to the land of Israel. Good. That means tourists are coming back. And then Jews uh, from those places are coming back as well. Um, also, I heard that there's uh, negotiations between Israel and Indonesia, which is good. It's a big Muslim country, the biggest. And uh, they want to be part of the OECD. And uh, the bottom line is that... Uh, 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 there's there's some kind of movement over on that level as well, so that's good news. The red heifers are still red heifering, and uh, I don't know if there's any updates other than the fact that it's obvious that Hamas and company are still very afraid of the red heifer. And I want you to know that one of the things that makes organizations like Hamas completely batty is this mysterious fact that while the Jews sometimes act weakly sometimes do not, you know, uh, finish this war properly or a million other things that you can complain about, we're still here and we're still thriving. You know, that's, it's like Joseph, you, you, you know, he's a servant, but he's thriving. Then he's in jail, but he's thriving. And that is something that drives the folks batty. Now, um, that's because they don't understand that, the, or they do understand that the real protection of Am Israel of the nation of Israel, is Hashem. And we have two characters that I recently covered in uh, the videos that I wanted to uh, bring to your attention today. One is the Pope in Rome, and one is Queen Rania. And I put Queen in, uh, in, uh, in hashtags, not hashtags, in, uh, in quote marks. Uh, I want to put them in quote marks because I don't think she's a queen at all. Uh, so let's hear a little bit about uh, what these guys think uh, about Israel and how they are working to weaken Israel at this time. And yet, Israel's not getting weaker. Maybe their positions, both the Pope's and the Queen's positions, are getting weaker. So let's hear, first hear from the Pope in Rome and how he sees the war with Israel and what he's trying to do about it. All right, it's fair to say that the Jewish people in Israel are in a crisis. We have Hamas uh, attacked us on October the 7th, murdered in horrific fashion 1,200 people. Rape, beheadings, destruction, killing of children and babies. We have them uh, still, uh, they're on the run, but they still have armament and tunnels, and not to mention international support. We have uh, the Iran, Iran-backed Iran militia in so southern Lebanon, Hezbollah, They've got 150,000 rockets trained against us. You have Iran itself uh, waiting to uh, create a nuclear bomb so they could launch it against Israel. And you have anti-Semitism around the world on American campuses and in American media. Now, you would think that the spiritual top spiritual leaders of the world would say, hey, we got to defend the people of God. We got to defend Israel, make sure that jihadism that wants to destroy Israel uh, doesn't succeed. And that jihadism around the world that wants to suppress people doesn't succeed as well. You'd think that that's what the Pope at the Vatican in Rome would say. But instead, it seems like he is backing uh, the uh, human shield, human shield idea that civilians and civilian workers are the main thing to protect in Gaza. Not to defend Israel, not to help the Gazan civilians leave, but rather that all the aid workers and the civilian population, i.e. the human shields for Hamas, that they're successful. Let's go to the Vatican and hear it from the Pope's mouth himself. 
Easter Sunday in Vatican City, before a packed crowd at St. Peter's Square filled with flowers, Pope Francis delivered a message calling for peace in Gaza. I appeal once again that access to humanitarian aid be ensured in Gaza and call once more for the prompt release of the hostages seized on October 7th and for an immediate ceasefire in the Strip. Let us not allow the current hostilities to continue to have grave repercussions on the civil population and above all, the children. Okay, so the real issue here is not Israel. Israel is not the thing to really be protected, right? First is make sure that there's humanitarian uh, aid to the people, i.e. a way to lessen the pressure on Hamas because their civilian population isn't going to be suffering, so therefore they're not going to pressure them to end this war, release the hostages, etc. So the first thing is the humanitarian aid. This is really, if you think about it, it's really a way of empowering the human shields that uh, that protect Hamas, right? So it's it's a way to protect Hamas. We're, I know it doesn't sound like that, it sounds like it's nice that you're going to protect the civilian population, but what it really means is stop the pressure on Hamas. The same. The next thing he said is, uh, quickly he said, release the hostages, and he went off immediately to say it's time for a ceasefire, i.e. everything has to be done to defend Hamas. You wouldn't think that the Pope would be so defensive of Hamas, but it's couched in, in humanitarian terms. It sounds nice, but it really means what it really amounts to is that Hamas will be protected and defended, and that if indeed a ceasefire is issued, like the Pope says, this will mean a gigantic and amazing victory for Hamas. They stood up to Israel. They attacked Israel and, and, and made an awful, horrible carnage. They took some civilian casualties, but that doesn't bother them at all. They don't care about the death of their people, but it's a win for them because they would have survived their people would have been even fed by the international world. The Pope will stand up for them, and Hamas will be victorious. I don't think that is the best solution. I don't think that's a solution for peace. I don't think that the survival of Hamas is, 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 a, is a recipe for peace in the region. No, not at all. The defeat of Hamas is a recipe for peace. The, the sustained war against Israel's war is a recipe for war. Let's hear what else the folks in the Vatican think. Calls for aid to Gaza have recently taken shape as a convoy of ships left a port in Cyprus Saturday carrying some 400 tons of food and other relief supplies. World Central Kitchen says the crafts carried ready-to-eat staples like rice, pasta, flour, canned vegetables and proteins, enough to prepare more than one million meals. The United Nations warns that famine could strike northern Gaza as early as this month. The United States military, along with regional partners, continues delivering relief in the form of airdropped pallets filled with food and water. Okay, so I, I want to I say something a little harsh, which is the pressure on the civilian population would have amounted to pressure on Hamas. The relief of pressure on the civilian population would have amounted uh, it, it is amounting to no pressure on Hamas. That's number one. Number two, does it strike you as strange that they are airdropping all this aid uh, onto Gaza? Do you ever wonder why they don't want to do the most simple thing of them all, which is to move the civilian population? The answer is that the biggest strategy right now to stop Israel is the human shield strategy. The aid workers, the civilian population, the feeding of all these people, the dropping of the air packages. It's all there to ensure that the civilian population who is now working for or is a pawn of Hamas will stay exactly put. That is the U.S. administration's strategy. That is Hamas's strategy, right? They're in cahoots. Keep them immobile. Make sure that they don't move. Make sure that they are fed. Use words like famine. Famine. What are we talking about here? What are we talking about? What is, what is, and this is the, of course, the missing element that nobody wants to talk about. What is the southern border of Gaza? It's Egypt, an Arab country. Many Gazans are from Egypt, and they certainly could go back to Egypt, and they certainly could go to the Sinai for a few months and, and have tents set up there to make sure that they're taken care of while Israel roots out the Hamas and the jihadists in general, including Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and all the groups there that hate Israel and want to destroy Israel. So, okay, you know, 
this is the new strategy. The new strategy, and I want people to see this, is to make sure that the civilian population does not leave. That is what they're trying to do. That is the Biden administration's strategy. That is Hamas's strategy and Iran's strategy and the Pope's strategy. strategy. They want to make sure that the people don't move, that Israel doesn't move them out. And certainly, that God forbid, Israel doesn't resettle the ancestral homeland of Gaza. That is the new strategy, okay? And if indeed Israel does end up killing civilians, strike Israel with that as well. Make Israel look bad because they hit innocent people. That is part of the strategy of weakening Israel and making sure that Hamas is the winner of this conflict. But the deliveries can be spotty at times without any organized distribution method on land. Israel declared war on Hamas following an October 7th surprise attack by the militant group in which it killed 1,200 and kidnapped more than 250. Is I want to show you a little trick that the media does. Notice that he's talking about how Hamas struck Israel. He's telling you the story about Hamas' strike on October 7th. But what are the images that they're showing? Look at the images. The images are that they're showing is Israel striking the Arabs. And, and striking Hamas and, and, and the, the, the jihadist movements. So he's talking about the evils that were done to Israel by Hamas, but you never see those images. You don't see Israeli soldiers being killed and murdered and women being taken away and raped and all this kind of thing, all the evils that were done. You don't see that. So he's saying that, but you don't see the image. Now, which one is more powerful, the audio or the video? Obviously the video, right? And so you are being told that, but you're never shown the pain of the Israelis because what they want to avert, these media folks, is Israeli justified rage. That's one of the main things that they want to make sure does not happen. You are not to feel rage for Israel, meaning to say in favor of Israel. You're only to feel rage against Israel. But he has to tell you the facts or else it's going to be, you know, bad reporting. So the reporting is accurate. But look, there's no images of Israeli people crying or Israeli pain. None of that. None of that appears in this whole video. The only victims that you'll see is the Arab side. All right. Israel has since placed a stranglehold on the entire oh. region, pummeling civilian infrastructure and restricting the flow of aid. Health officials in Gaza say more than 32,000 Palestinians have been killed. The United Nations International Court of Justice issued two provisional... Okay, so here you go. Here's the image. I'm sorry to have to show you this image. Here's an image of, of an Arab, a Palestinian, probably a jihadist uh, who, who was involved and got, and, got, uh, and got hit by shrapnel or whatever it is. Uh, but the point is, look, you're seeing his suffering, but you never saw Jewish suffering because you don't want to, God forbid, justify the Jewish war, the Israeli war against the jihad. Now he's talking about international law, right? Now the next thing is that they're going to hit against you is first that they told you Israel is a killer of, of the civilian population. They're showing you the images. Now they're telling you the story about how the international community is against. And that goes back to the beginning of the video, which is the Pope. The Pope is calling for a ceasefire, just like the international community. All this amounts to one thing, Hamas victory using human shields, using the international community to stop Israel from fighting this just war. ...measures in a case brought by South Africa accusing Israel of genocide, a charge Israel flatly denies. But for okay, so, so where were we? First we had the Pope, he said ceasefire. Then we had the, the starving Palestinians, and uh, and and the the you know the the victims of Hamas, but they're really now the victims of Israel and the food drops. Then you had uh, an image uh, of suffering Arabs, somebody hit by by shrapnel, uh, and and that the international community uh, took Israel to court and said that the war is illegal or should be stopped. Now the piece de resistance, which is the Israelis that are against the war. Notice he's not going to tell you about the vast majority of Israelis. Who are in favor of this war. He's not going to tell you about the army fighting, wanting to fight more, asking the, the government to give us more rights to fight because they want to they want to attack and destroy Hamas. They're not going to show you the anger of Israelis uh, against Hamas and wanting to flatten Gaza as, as so many times you hear here in Israel. No, the only thing he's going to show you now is the internal pressure against Israel by Israelis that want to see the end of the conflict quickly. Let's see 
how they cover this. For many Israelis, an ongoing war isn't the answer as they took to the streets demanding their government sign a ceasefire agreement with Hamas in exchange for hostages still held by the group Western powers identify as a terror organization on Sunday. By the way, I don't know if you noticed, a little media trick is that the camera was was kind of shaking needlessly. It's like, well, it wasn't like so many people, right? But like the camera made it look like it was a tumult. It's just a camera trick. They use these tricks all the time. So the camera was waving around to be like, whoa, whoa, it's a crazy tumult. Israelis are breaking through the lines to stop this war. But is that the real truth? Of course not. Israelis, vast majority of Israelis are in favor of this war and want the war to be stronger. They want it to be even more robust against the jihad at the church of the holy sepulcher in jerusalem widely considered the most holy site in christianity the archbishop held easter mass in a church emptier than years past as since october 7th palestinian worshipers need special permission to cross checkpoints into jerusalem arash arabasadi voa news okay so it ended with uh, the final claim which is that israel is not letting Cri uh, christian palestinians arabs come into Jerusalem easily. They're blocking that. And so this is a nicely tight piece because it ends with uh, the Christians in Jerusalem, starts with the Pope. And so there's a whole Easter thing going on here. And basically, Israel is the bad guy from beginning to end. Uh, the hostages, just a, a small mention of them, you never see the pain. And this is a media trick. This is a media trick. Uh, this, this whole, this whole, uh, um, uh, uh, this whole, as we say in Hebrew, katavad, this whole piece, right? This whole piece is one that tries to still stick Israel into a very negative light. Uh, it is fighting an unjust war. It is it is hurting people needlessly. It is not letting people pray. It doesn't want to cease fire, but the government's out of control because it's not listening to the people. And it's all a sham. It's all just a sham because we know what happened. Jihad is uh, surrounding us, trying to destroy Israel. And instead of letting, instead of the Pope, uh, saying the truth, which is uh, Israel should defend itself against the jihadism, which is, of course, also against Christianity and, and, and against the Pope and against all these things. No, the, the, the team is ganging up uh, on Israel to destroy the Jewish state, and they want to weaken it. And they basically want the October 7th to be a total success for Hamas. We won't let them. We know the truth. God is with us. History is with us. Israel's got to fight the jihad. Israel's got to, got to clean out the jihad from Gaza and take it over and also govern there and also resettle the place. Of course, let decent people who love Israel li live there as well. But haters got to go. And Israel's got to strike hard against the jihad all around it. A strong Israel equals peace for this region. A weak Israel is a victory for the Hamas. And it's sad that the Pope is in line with the U.S. administration uh, and with Iran and with Hamas to weaken Israel. But I know the truth. You know the truth. We won't let them. We'll keep up the fight. Don't worry. The Ishai Flasher show will be right back. So stay tuned. Okay, we're back. Ishai Flasher show still live from the drive. And I'm seeing camels. Yes, official camel sighting right now on my right. Um, I'm, uh, I just went through the southern Hebron Hills. And soon I'm going to be taking a left to a, a hidden gem city, which is Arad. Arad, a great city in the desert. I love it so much. Uh, and that reminds me that I'm hungry. And that reminds me of the good friends at Prohibition Pickle uh, that make delicious kosher food for the nation. Prohibitionpickle.co.il. They are part of our uh, team. Uh, and uh, the good folks at RetroWatchGuy.com. RetroWatchGuy.com uh, bring you back great watches from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s and play soft rock. While they're doing it, the best selection, uh, retrowatchguy.com. Okay, so I'm heading down right now uh, south. I'm seeing Bedouin encampments that, if we don't be careful, will definitely turn into uh, uh, little cities that they're going to claim that are theirs, uh, because uh, the land, the land of Israel, sadly, uh, while while there's great light, there's also uh, a hostile takeover uh, of our land and of our narrative. So. The uh, one of the great hostile takeovers of our land and our narrative is the first Palestinian state, which was Jordan. Remember that the so-called Palestinian movement wants four states. They want Jordan, which is Palestinian, right? It's Arabs from this region, and that's what they call themselves. And then they got Gaza, 
then they want Judea and Samaria, then they want uh, to take over Israel with the vote. They basically want four Arab states, I heard this from Caroline Glick many years ago, four Arab states on one, uh, one piece of land. Let's hear, that's not very equitable, right? No Jewish state there, of course. They want to get rid of us. Uh, we won't let them. But let's hear about the efforts of uh, the, uh, the uh, Jordans. Let's see, I put Jordan in quote marks, or the kingdom of Jordan, I put that in quote marks. And I put queen in quote marks. And Rania, uh, she was on with Christiana Manpour. Here we go. So as the war progresses here in Israel, the uh, attitude of the international community that wants to shrink Israel, the Israel shrinkers, the ones that want Israel to see, see Israel defeated, that want to see Hamas be victorious, there's really a new global strategy. That strategy is to make sure that there's a humanitarian crisis, that Israel hits humanitarian workers, to flood Gaza with these humanitarian workers so that you can't, you can't operate at all, you can't fight. And that is one of the keys to the kind of latest efforts against Israel. They want to stop the war. The very same countries <clears throat> who just a few months ago were saying, we're with you, Israel, and we're lighting up the Eiffel Tower with blue and white, are now saying, Israel, you got to stop. There's a humanitarian crisis, and we want to make sure that there is a humanitarian crisis so that we could stop you, so that we could make sure that Hamas declares victory. Uh, that's the key right now. And one of the players, of course, uh, is Jordan, the country of Jordan. And you're going to hear now from Queen Rania. How exactly is she a queen? Well, first thing, when you, when you speak to Jordanians, and I do, you ask them, what do you really think about your monarchy there, your so-called monarchy? Well, they say, well, they're corrupt. These people are totally corrupt. We live in a poor country, in a destitute country, but the king and queen live off the fat of the land. And uh, they enjoy the fruits of our labor, uh, and they live in these big palaces. Moreover, the king is a Hashemite, which basically means he's like a Bedouin from Saudi Arabia, and he has nothing to do with this area. But the reason he rules it is because the British, in their colonialist uh, gasps, created uh, this fake kingdom of Jordan. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to do a favor for their Hashemite uh, clients. And they didn't want the Hashemites to get into, the war, into a war in Syria. And basically, they're like, no, 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 we're going to give you this area. We're going to cut it away from what we promised to the Jews, that we recognize Jewish land, and we'll cut it away and we'll create it into this Transjordan, which later was called Jordan, the kingdom of Jordan. But the king is a totally fake colonialist construct. Moreover, Queen Rania is a, a self-identified Palestinian but not from Palestine, so-called. She's actually from Kuwait. Her parents emigrated. As you can see, Palestinians don't have to live in Palestine, i.e. Arabs of the land of Israel don't have to live in the land of Israel. They could actually be living somewhere else, as we saw also in the video that I did about, uh, about, uh, about Palestine Way in Patterson, New Jersey. So her parents, long time ago, left to Kuwait. She was born in Kuwait, so she's really a Kuwaiti but identifies as a Palestinian. But why is she the queen of Jordan? Because Jordan is actually a Palestinian state. Ta-da! 80% of Jordanians are actually self-identified Palestinians, not Bedouins like the king. Uh, and so they live as a majority, but as a minority status. And, and basically, uh, they're, they're subjugated by this uh, king and queen. Uh, but they see themselves as, as Palestinian, which is interesting because maybe another way to think about this is that Jordan could be a Palestine for Palestinians, i.e. Arabs living in this region could have a state which was once a Jewish state, a part of the Jewish land. They could have a two-state solution and make their life in Jordan or even stay in Israel as residents of Israel, but get Jordanian citizenship, thereby being in the real having citizenship in Palestine, but staying in Israel if, they're, of course, they're peace-loving, non-jihadist, pro-Israel Arabs. But in simple terms, Jordan is a Palestine, right? So, uh, but Queen Rania, Queen Rania, she's very munificent and magnificent, and she wants to make sure that no more Palestinians come to Jordan. She doesn't want her kingdom to be overrun. What will happen to all those privileges? So she is now making sure 
that there are human shields in Gaza. She wants to make sure that nobody leaves Gaza. She's going to airdrop all kinds of stuff to them over there. Her husband is a pilot or her father-in-law was certainly a pilot. In any case, so these guys, they want to make sure that they're, A, perceived that as good and that Israel's perceived as, as a, a humanitarian crisis maker, uh, you know, a starver of children. That's perfect. And she's going to call for ceasefire now, which means Hamas wins. Ceasefire equals Hamas wins. Uh, so Queen Rania, uh, here she is with uh, the, uh, the, the great Israel enemy, Christiana Manpour. Let's see what she says. And that is implementing an immediate and sustained ceasefire opening all access we want an, uh, an immediate and sustained ceasefire i.e we want hamas to declare victory on israel because all hamas has to do to declare victory is survive that's all they have to do if they could just survive in those tunnels boom they have declared victory if they can make it past this war and she wants what else does she want she wants a, a ceasefire she wants humanitarian corridors she wants the corridors open except for one the Egyptian corridor, right? Nobody wants the Egyptian corridor open because Arabs might actually leave Gaza to find safety, shelter, or, or, or resettlement, uh, and even in different countries, but at least through the corridor of Egypt. So nobody wants that. That would make too much sense. It would be it, nobody wants Israel to win by having Arabs leave Gaza, destroy Hamas, and then allow Arabs that are pro-Israel, non-jihadist uh, uh, peace lovers to re-enter or find a different life or for the enemies of Israel or, or those even who just want a different life, find the life somewhere else in Egypt and Arab countries or around the world. They don't want that. They want to make sure that they're stuck there in Gaza as uh, human shields. All right. So that's what she wants. She wants a ceasefire now, i.e. Hamas victory and human shields to remain there. Into Gaza, particularly land routes, uh, streamlining the inspection process and making sure that there is safe access within Gaza so that the aid can be distributed. Every moment counts. Children are starving as we speak. So every moment and every meal counts. Uh, and so I think now we're past the stage. Every meal counts. I, I wonder how many people in your corrupt, corrupt monarchy uh, like how you guys uh, uh, eat fat while your people starve over there, uh, or at least live in, 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 in squalor and poverty. But OK, you know, she's got she's got the look. And she's got the stuff behind her. She's going to be sending that stuff. She's going to be flying it over to Gaza over there. She's not going to help them uh, uh, escape. She's not going to uh, welcome them with open arms. She's not going to welcome one refugee. No, she won't. But she will make Israel look bad. And sometimes I wonder, I wonder about Israel. Israel, like, why do you help Jordan survive? Why do you prop these guys up? Who does that? Why does that even make sense? You know that Jordan wouldn't survive a day without Israeli defense contractors making sure the jihad doesn't take over. And it wouldn't survive a day without the water that we provide from them from the Jordan River, which amounts to millions of, 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 of water cube, cubes, or what are cubes, whatever it's called, water tonnage, water amounts uh, every single year. Israel basically irrigates Jordan. It basically irrigates Jordan. So, like, why do we do this? Why do we allow this, this person to besmirch us, to hate on us, this fake queen? That, 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 you know, now she's talking about morality. She won't let one refugee in. Age of trying to talk Israel into doing these things, we need to actually start using measures and political leverage to get them to do those things. Can I? Of course, the jihad, by the way, just parenthetically, the jihad would love nothing more than to overturn these guys as well. That's the funny irony of it all. The jihad actually would love to destroy the Hashemite kingdom as well. But it doesn't matter because, because when it comes to Israel hate, people love to get together. And so Queen Rania uh, is, I'm sorry to say, a fake queen. And Jordan is a fake kingdom. Uh, and uh, it could even be, if we, if we so uh, uh, dare to imagine, a uh, Palestinian state where we could have a two-state solution. Uh, Jordan, where Arabs are living there. Um, of course, they too would have to be a non-jihadist because, we're, or else we're going to have to make war on them because we make war on jihad. Israel cannot have jihad on its borders any longer. October 7th has taught us that. And so it's time for zero jihad in Gaza, zero jihad in southern Lebanon, zero jihad in Jordan. Uh, but can we see through some of these lies that Queen, Queen, quote unquote, Queen Rania is telling us out there with Christiana Manpour? All right, folks, God bless you. Uh, stay tuned, stay subscribed, stay part of it. Write me an email, Yishai, YishaiFleischer.com. Subscribe to Yishai Fleischer TV. Lots more good stuff is on the way. God bless you and shalom. This is Yohanan from Germany. Don't worry. God bless you. All the best. Have a lechaim. 
Ishai Fleischer. We'll be right back. All right, we're back here on the Ishai Fleischer Show. Uh, thank you so much uh, for staying with me uh, and helping me broadcast. Um, my friend Jeremy Gimpel said to me very correctly that I don't need to ask you just for help to do my little thing. I need your help to keep broadcasting the message, our message, my message, this message, Israel's message, God's message, the Torah's message to the world. Your help is very needed. A simple way to do it is through buymeacoffee.com forward slash Yishai. Uh, that's for smaller support and donations. But if you want to be part of the bigger projects that we're doing and helping us get our voice out there, uh, we need technology, we need we need manpower, we need uh, beautification and restoration. We've got a lot of things going on. That's at YishaiFleischer.com, <clears throat> and you'll see there the donate button. So thank you very much for that. Um, speaking of donation, um, I want to thank also the Jewish community of Hebron for giving me an amazing opportunity to talk about the Jewish community of Hebron, to talk about the biblical connection to Hebron. And I want you to check out a, a wonderful website, hebronfund.org, and help us stay strong over there. And so too, if you're already in the Hebron mood, you got to be in the mood for the Temple Mount, and that's highonthehar.com. Come and visit the Temple Mount. For God's sakes, exactly that. I would call it, here's my new slogan, highonthehar.com, for God's sakes. Right, <laughs> for the sake of God. There you go. Okay, um, speaking of donations, a problem is, is that the state of Israel itself oftentimes uh, donates to our enemies. Uh, here is um, near Barkat on Joe Scarborough, and... Um, and the issues that was discussed there, you'll see uh, how Joe gives a hard time to near Barkat, and so do I. Here we go. Okay, Joe Scarborough may be a media guy, but he's also a former congressman. He's a smart guy. He knows how government, it works. He understands how, how America works, and he probably has a good guess about how Israel works. And he gave Nir Barkat, Minister Nir Barkat, a really hard time asking him a simple question. Why is it that the government of Israel was supporting and sending money to the Hamas? Why did Benjamin Netanyahu, knowing that their charter said that they were to kill Jews and eradicate Israel, why would any leader of Israel work to, to fund that organization to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars and work with Qatar to fund Hamas? Why was it sending money to the Hamas, says Joe to Nir Barakat? It's like if you guys have such a great intelligence uh, uh, organization, the intelligence gathering abilities, why didn't you know that there's going to be this attack? In the meantime, you're funding these people. And near Barkat, I got to say, he really balked. He really, he really like missed an opportunity to say the truth and clear the air. In some cases, 13 hours. Where was Benjamin Netanyahu? Where was the IDF? Where the, were the defense forces over those 12, 13 hours while the worst slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust was unfolding within 40, 50 miles of, 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 of Netanyahu? Let me answer you. We will investigate that. We were caught by surprise. And there are many, many uh, faults, many faults. Uh, let me ask both you this. of the how army and the government. How could you, how could you be answer. caught Please by surprise? How could yeah. you be caught by surprise when you had Hamas's plans for a year? Netanyahu well, had Hamas's terror attacks for a year. Why didn't answer, they please. act on it? These faults will be uncovered. And there are many, many challenges. And we will investigate everything. Honestly, believe me, everyone in Israel... Right, left. We all want to go down to the to deep uh, to, to, to investigate, have deep investigations on this issue. OK, but this is not the time right now. We have to focus yeah. on winning the war. With all due respect, this is not the time to interrogate and ask these questions. He could have said the truth. The truth is that the government of Israel has been paying our enemies for a long time. They created the Palestinian Authority so that they would govern a piece of land that has people that Israel is afraid to deal with, that doesn't want to deal with. It doesn't want to police uh, the Arabs of Judea and Samaria, so-called Palestinians, the Arabs of Gaza. So they created the Palestinian Authority, and then Hamas came along as well. 
But instead of crushing those guys and saying, no, we're going to govern this land. And we're going to deal with those minorities, those people. We're going to figure out a way to give them decencies and rights, but crush the jihad from our land. No, instead they created these organizations and, and fed them. And fed them. And then in the meantime, while these organizations were preparing to do jihad, and we did have that intelligence... They were like, let's just appease them. Let's just give them some more land. Give them more money. They just want governance. If we give them like pools and food and, and, and a good life, then they'll get off the jihad track. They'll see reason. Right? And so this is called the conceptia here in Israel, the conception. That if you give away your land, which is a very anti-Middle East thing to do, you give your land to your enemies, you're like nobody. You're contemptible. Okay, give away your land, let other people rule them in horrible ways as well, in, 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 in oppressive ways. The PA is oppressive, Hamas is oppressive. And you think they're going to calm down from jihadism? You think that they're going to be bought off by, by Western gifts? No, no. In your face did October 7th happen, after you thought the Hamas was going to govern for you, and you were going to pay them off. In your face it happened, and now it's time to breathe some air of truth near Barkat. Tell Joe Scarborough the truth. We sinned. We did an awful thing for all these years. We gave away our land and we paid others to rule. And in the meantime, they prepared to take away the rest of our land. And we didn't understand it. We were stuck in bad concepts, in the conceptia. We were stuck in those bad ideas and we paid for them and then we paid for it doubly on October the 7th. And we were wrong and we sinned. We say in Hebrew, Al Chet, strike against your heart and say, I was wrong. I was part of that evil. And now it's time to fix it. Now it's time to roll back those evil policies. Now it's time to destroy the Hamas and the Jihad to take that land, to hold on to it and to govern it for the good of the Jewish people and for the good of the minorities that live there. It's time to roll the two-state solution back. It's time to stop paying terrorists, to destroy other people, to rule other people in, in, in oppression, and then to prepare jihad against us. Say it, near Barkat. Say it. We were wrong. We sinned. Netanyahu sinned. We all sinned. It's time to get off that track. It's time to get back to health. And the first step towards health is to say the truth. My name is David Greco from Nashville, Tennessee. You're listening to the Yeshai Fleischer Show. When I get home, I like to kick back with a beer and listen to the Yeshai Fleischer Show. Don't be afraid. Yeshai Fleischer Show will be right back, so stay tuned. All right, we're back here on the Yeshai Fleischer Show. Live on the drive, heading down south right now. I'm seeing the beautiful land of Israel. It's such a blessed land. And uh, that's, why, that's why there's so many curses that try to come up on it to destroy that blessing, to undermine that blessing. We can't let them do that. And we pray to Hashem, Hashem, God Almighty, please, please don't let our enemies hurt one more person, one more Jew, one more friend of Israel. Don't allow it, Hashem. Please, please stop it. Help us. Give us the strength to push towards the redemption that you promised and, and are fulfilling. Uh, okay, Ben Bresky, our intrepid reporter is one and only. And speaking of reporters, before we get to Ben Bresky, let's not forget that we have great news organizations that are at our back, that are with us, jns.org and jewishpress.com. I really do recommend, somebody asked me the other day, what are the what are the top three news outlets? jewishpress.com, jns.org, and Arut Sheva, israelnationalnews.com. Uh, we have our own intrepid reporter, Ben Bresky, and he's on a rant to tell us about the pre-state period and how people really envisioned Israel and how it came about. So here's Ben Bresky with an amazing story about a man who had a vision for Israel. This is a moment in Jewish history. Last week, I discussed the story of Warder Kressen, who in the 1840s promoted the idea of the Jewish people returning to the land of Israel. He corresponded with a like-minded person named Mordechai Manuel Noah, one of the most prominent Jewish Americans of his day. Noah even defended Cresson during his famous trial for insanity. Check out last week's Yishai Fleischer Show for more information on that. But what I want to focus on today is Ararat, 
not the mountain where Noah's Ark landed, but the Jewish homeland located in Grand Island, New York, near Buffalo. Keep in mind that Theodore Herzl did not preside over the first Zionist Congress until 1897. That was the event that put Zionism on the map and became a phenomenon that swept the Jewish world, resulting in the creation of a Jewish state. But this was the mid-1800s, and the majority of the Jewish population did not live in Israel or the United States, but in Europe, Russia, and North Africa. Mordechai Manuel Noah spent a great deal of time and money creating a refuge for persecuted Jewish immigrants from Europe and Russia. When none actually showed up, he shifted his focus to repatriate the Jewish people directly to their ancient homeland in Israel. But first, some biographical information. Mordechai Manuel Noah was born in 1785 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was the grandson of Jonas Phillips, a veteran of the Revolutionary War and a founding member of Congregation Mikvah Israel, one of the oldest synagogues in America. Noah grew up in his grandfather's home and went on to study law and become involved in politics. In 1811, President James Madison appointed him consul to the Kingdom of Tunis, today the capital city of Tunisia in North Africa. As part of his role, he successfully released American citizens who were captured by Barbary pirates. During this period, Noah visited England, France, and Spain. There, he came into contact with other Jewish communities. Unlike in the United States, Jewish people in these regions did not have the same voting rights or freedom to run for office. Noah saw the return to Zion as a solution, but the easiest and most effective way would be to create a temporary haven in his own backyard. Upon his return from abroad, he moved to New York where he became a successful newspaper editor and playwright. In 1818, at the dedication of a new building for Congregation She'arith Israel, Noah was one of the guest speakers. There, he talked about the return of the Jews to the land of Israel. Like many of his day, he referred to the general region not as the Middle East, but as Syria. The following are excerpts. They will march in triumphant numbers and possess themselves once more of Syria, and take their rank among the governments of the earth. I have been too much among them in Europe and Africa. I am too well acquainted with their views and sentiments in Asia to doubt their intentions. Let us hope that the day is not far distant when we may look forward toward a country where our people have established a mild, just, and honorable government, accredited by the world and admired by all good men. Until the Jews can recover their ancient rights and dominions and take their ranks among the governments of the earth, this is their chosen country. Now, the land of Israel was pretty far away and under control of the Ottoman Empire. While right in his home state of New York, there was Grand Island in between Buffalo and Niagara Falls. This was a period of American history when many religious groups, such as the Mormons and the Shakers, were creating agricultural communities. And so, finally, on September 15th, 1825, the day came to inaugurate what he called Ararat, City of Refuge. It was a grand affair, with a band, elected officials, and thousands in attendance. Noah stated, Brothers, countrymen, and friends, having made known by proclamation the reestablishment of the Hebrew government, having laid the foundations of a city of refuge and asylum for the oppressed in this free and happy republic, I avail myself of that portion of my beloved brethren here assembled. It is proper for me to state that this asylum is temporary and provisionary. The Jews never should and never will relinquish the just hope of regaining possession of their ancient heritage and events in the neighborhood of Palestine indicate an extraordinary change of affairs. Mordechai Manuel Noah envisions Ararat as a stepping stone for the persecuted Jews of the world until the political situation could be worked out in what they called Palestine, a section of southern Syria. A 400-pound foundation stone was placed. It read in English and Hebrew, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Ararat, a city of refuge for the Jews, founded by Mordechai Manuel Noah in the month of Tishrei, September, in the 50th year of American independence. 
because of the large crowd, no one actually set foot on Grand Island, not even Noah. And then it was time for Noah to invite his fellow Jews to arrive at Ararat. It was not successful. Rabbi Abraham de Colonia, chief rabbi of Paris, who was once a member of Napoleon's Sanhedrin, replied to Noah's invitation as follows. To speak seriously, it is right at once to inform Mr. Noah that the venerable Mr. Herschel and Mendola, chief rabbis at London, and myself thank him, but positively refuse the appointments he has been placed to confer upon us. Mr. Noah has doubtlessly forgotten that the Israelites, faithful to the principles of their belief, are too much attached to the countries where they dwell and devoted to their governments. We should be sorry to refuse him the title of a visionary of good intentions. Other Jewish leaders in France, Austria, and Russia were not so polite. One called him the crazy man. Ararat was never to be populated. Noah returned to his journalism career and became a New York politician, but his dreams of Jewish liberation continued. In 1837, he wrote, The Jewish people must now do something for themselves. They must move onward to the accomplishment of that great event long foretold, long promised, long expected. My belief is that Syria will revert to the Jewish nation by purchase and that the facility exhibited by the accumulation of wealth has been a provincial and peculiar gift to enable them at the proper time to reoccupy their ancient possessions by the purse string instead of the sword. Keep in mind that this was 60 years before the Jewish National Fund was established to purchase land and plant trees in Israel. In 1845, Noah wrote, Discourse on the Restoration of the Jews. In it, he states, The land of Israel will one day once more pass into the possession of the descendants of Abraham. The ports of the Mediterranean will again open to the busy hum of commerce. The fields again bear the fruitful harvest. This is our destiny. Every attempt to colonize the Jews in other countries has failed. Their eye has steadily rested on their own beloved Jerusalem, and they have said, The time will come, the promise will be fulfilled. The Jews are in a most favorable position to repossess themselves of the promised land and organize a free and liberal government. Agriculture was once their natural employment. The land is now desolate, according to the prediction of the prophets, but it is full of hope and promise. The soil is rich, the climate is mild, and double crops in the lowlands may be annually anticipated. Everything is produced in the greatest variety, wheat, barley, Rice, oats, and cotton are raised in great abundance. Indigo is produced on the banks of the Jordan. Olives and olive oil are found everywhere. And oranges, figs, dates, pomegranates, and all tropical fruits known to us flourish everywhere throughout Syria. When the Jewish people can return to Palestine and feel that in their persons and property they are safe from danger and ready to unfold the standard when political events shall demonstrate to them that the time is arrived. Remember, my countrymen, you whose aid is invoked to assist in the restoration, that we are to return as we went forth, to bring back to Zion the faith we carried away with us. The temple under Solomon, which we built as Jews, we must again erect as the chosen people. For two thousand years we have been pursued and persecuted, and we are yet here. Assemblages of men have formed communities, built cities, established governments, rose, prospered, decayed, and fell, and yet we are still here. Mordechai Manuel Noah's dream for Ararat never worked out, but his envisioning of an independent Jewish state in the land of Israel did eventually come to fruition. The state of Israel was established 123 years after Noah's attempt of creating Ararat, and today Israel is a thriving country. Today, Grand Island is populated and suburban, with over 21,000 people. The 400-pound cornerstone for Ararat, dedicated back in 1825, was placed in the Buffalo History Museum, where it can still be seen today. This has been a moment in Jewish history. Thank you to Yishai Fleischer. Thank you to all the listeners, and Shalom. 
Thank you very much, Ben Bresky. That was fabulous. You are fabulous. And I'm live on the drive right now. I want to bless all of you guys. And I want to thank Ben uh, because people really love his segment and people love the history. Uh, and with him is Ben Bresky, Tabitha, Yochevet Seidman, Moshe Herman, uh, and Lou when we're live. I want to thank you guys for being part of the broadcast team and getting this out to the world, this important message. This week's Torah portion is Tazria, which is uh, when, when a woman will, be, will, will become pregnant. And uh, I think there's nothing more hopeful in this world than birth. And there's nothing more being birthed than the people of Israel and the land of Israel, the Torah of Israel. It's all being birthed right now. And uh, we've, got to, we've got to know that we're in a great time that's being birthed. And with that comes, of course, uh, also uh, Tumah. There's blood. There's ritual impurity that comes with the greatest of purities. And uh, that's the period that we're living in right now. We're living in a time of great birth and rebirth. And with that, ritual impurity as well. That's right. There's all kinds of stuff that's happening that's hard, that's hard to deal with. Uh, for example, the uh, aid workers that were killed, the whole world is making a, a huge deal out of it. But it's obvious now, n- not like I said last week, uh, that they were actually uh, uh, ar- ar- armed uh, British nationals, that, or, or not armed, uh, British military nationalists, like I said last week. But really, in fact, it's coming out very clearly that this was a Hamas mission to have Israel strike at these aid workers. It was purposeful uh, false flag operations in order so that Israel would strike it so that the world could come down like Amer- like Biden and say, you know, Israel, you are uh, striking at innocent civilians. That's the uh, false flag operation. Okay, we won't let them. We won't let them drown out the light. And I know that you won't let them. I want to bless you wherever you are. Write me an email, Yishai, YishaiFleischer.com. Thank you so much for being with us. I want to bless all of you to see this good land, to touch this good land. Open up that Torah. Open up that Bible. Feel that Hashem's light that comes through Moses' face that is written in the words of the Torah. Look at that picture of the land of Israel. Say hi to your Jewish neighbor. And, and, and channel through that the blessings of Hashem. Hashem is channeling unbelievable light right now. And that's exactly why this darkness wants to come upon us. We're going to push them back. We're going to push back the Iranians and the Qataris and all the junk uh, that's trying to block out the amazing light of God. God bless you folks wherever you are. Lots of love, lots of blessings from the land of blessings. And shalom.